everybody, it's Jeff Antoniak. Welcome to Digging Deeper Jazz. Today, I wanna talk about how to learn tunes. And um, I can imagine some people out there wondering like, why is this even important? I've got my iPad, I've got my phone, I've got my PDFs of whatever. Um, and yes, we live in a digital age where memorizing things is actually not the best way to go sometimes when all the information is there online. Sheer memorization for memorization's sake is not necessary in the world we live in. Here's the thing, this is different. <laughs> so you have to memorize your tunes. Now, uh, I'm gonna give you two reasons why that is. One is if you want to be a professional musician, and I will say, if you've tuned into these videos, you know I'm talking to the adult amateurs, you know I'm talking to the semi-pros. For a moment, if we're talking about professionals or the semi-pros that wanna be out there playing gigs, it is not professional to be farting around with music stands and fake books and screwing around with your iPad on stage. That's not cool. That's not what you're getting paid for. You're getting paid to be a professional. A professional knows what they're doing. So you need to know the tunes. Okay, fair enough. Um, now the second side of it is most important, more important, is that this is how you get good. Learning songs, memorizing them, internalizing music, is how we get there. Just that word, internalizing. Um, when you're reading something, it's outside your body. It's out there and you're looking at it and trying to do something with it and now make art, make a statement out of it. That's a lot of extra steps. When it's internalized, think about the things that you have internalized, right? You know the face of a good dear friend, right? You know the smell of some cooking that you love. Those internalized things, that's where the meaning comes from. So uh, we have to get this stuff internalized. And I'll tell you a personal story. Um, when I was studying uh, in school, I went to the University of North Texas, very famous school. And um, I was, I didn't want to memorize tunes. I, it, it made me anxious. I didn't think I could do it. it. I was overwhelmed by people I knew that knew 500 songs. How is that possible? I can't do that. So I just became a little bit frozen up to even be able to start. Um, and I am a vi very visually oriented person, you know, reading the eyeball connection. That's big for me. So, okay, I had my excuses. Um, I was practicing a lot and I noticed I wasn't getting a lot better. When it came time to solo, I wasn't getting a lot better. My friends were getting better. I wasn't getting better. So I practiced more. I'm talking... This is college level, four, five, six hours of practice a day, and it's not coming out in my playing. What the heck? So at some point, uh, sort of unrelated to this, a band leader I was working with said, I'm going to fire you because you keep showing up with milk crates full of real books and fake books. And that's BS, what I just said before. That's not professional. I'm going to fire you. And I said, can you give me a week? <laughs> I didn't want to get fired. That's how I was paying my rent. So... Um, Okay, note to self. So I went back and I put a hold on all the cool licks that I had been practicing and everything else. And it's like, all right, time to memorize these songs I've been playing for years. Take the A-Train and Blue Bossa, stuff like that. I started memorizing these songs just to save my gig. Here's the thing. My playing took off in that time, in those weeks and months, as I was memorizing songs, my playing got better more than maybe at any other time in my life. Why would that be? I had stopped, ostensibly I had stopped practicing. I'd stopped learning new stuff. How is it I got better? Well, my thought on it is, it was sort of like I was someone that, that went you know, to an old school computer store and I just kept buying software. You know, those boxes that had the disks in them and I'd collect software, but I'd never opened the box. I was great at buying stuff. I was great at collecting things, but um, it never occurred to me to actually try using them. There was no context to that stuff. So I was collecting licks. I was collecting scales. I was collecting tempos I could play at. I was collecting keys, but none of it was music. It was about music. So when I started playing music in my practice, all of a sudden there was a context for everything I had learned to now fit into and come out. In. So I hadn't done that last important step. This is why it's so important to memorize songs. Just reading them, it doesn't work the same way. So I'm telling you my own experience 
my playing jumped ahead when I started memorizing some songs. So this is what I want you to do. There's my lecture, I'm gonna get off my soapbox. What I'm gonna put up on the screen for you is a set of chord changes. So why would we jump to chord changes? These particular chord changes are the chord changes for the first eight measures of many, many, many songs that are out there, including The Girl from Ipanema and Take the A Train and Crazy Rhythm and Desafinato. I'll play a bunch of them for you in just a little bit. So how is this helpful? We know why we want to learn songs. I hope I've impressed that upon you. So now how do we learn songs? How do we become one of these people that knows 50 songs or 100 songs or 500 songs? So here's the thing. Um, you don't have to learn 500 songs to know 500 songs. Kind of like uh, if English is your first language or if you're able to listen to this, you know good English and you know the words right, the word right with an R, or blight, or plight, or fight. Those all come from a category of words that have G-H-T in them, right? So somewhere in my mind, there's a file cabinet where I keep my G-H-T words. And when I learn a new G-H-T word, I relate it to those other ones, right? That's really how memory works. I've read a fair amount about memory. That's my understanding, is we have these things that sort of lean on previous memories, right? That's powerful. That's how we're able to remember a lot of things. So what would it be like if there were 40 important jazz songs you need to know and they were almost identical in some ways? Well, that's true. The blues, right? There's probably 40 blues songs you should know, written by Charlie Parker and Sonny Rollins and Pat Metheny and on and on. They share the same form. They share the same chord changes. A lot of them share the same melodic device or the same phrasing. So, ah, when you have to learn those 40 songs, it turns out that you know two-thirds of the song before you get started. You just learn a different melody or a different way the blues scale moves through it, right? So that's the idea. So the blues is a first good place to start. When you're learning, memorizing some songs, learn the blues progression, that simple 12 measures, and now memorize three or four different blues tunes, and you're off and running. So what I want to say today is this set of chord changes that you see right in front of you. And what it is, is we could call it the one chord for two measures the major one chord for two measures, then the dominant two chord for two more measures, and then a two, five, one progression. So I went through that pretty quickly. Um, hopefully you know what I'm talking about when I say a dominant two chord or a two, five, one. If not, there's other videos of mine in the past that you can go look at and find out more about that. This set of chords is the backbone of so many songs. So let me see if I can uh, play, I'm gonna play a bunch of A sections for you right now, and we're gonna play Name That Tune. Here we go.
So there's a whole pile of tunes that use the same or almost exactly the same chord changes. And there's triple that number that I can think of. I actually put it up on Facebook and had a lot of my jazz friends kind of chime in and came up with more examples than I could think of. So the point is, if you know those chord changes, and they're pretty easy to remember, right? If you know those chord changes, it's a matter of can you remember these great melodies? So now, of course, learning the melodies. Well, these are melodies we've probably been hearing for years and years, right? So it's a matter of connecting the melody with this set of chord changes. So in my head, there's the file cabinet of here's all the songs that go to the dominant two chord. In my head is, um, you know, and, and there's more chord changes like this. So all the chords that start with a dominant two, two, five, one. So uh, that would be in a mellow tone by Duke Ellington, or it would be But Not For Me by George Gershwin, on and on, right? All the songs that are in minor and go to the minor four. So the, a song like Summertime does that, or a song like Blue Bossa does that. And now my organization system can be different than yours, but the point is you need to know that if there's 500 different songs, they're not different songs. The f there's similarities of form. There's similarities in phrasing. There's definitely similarities in the underlying harmonic structure, which is one of the things that people seem to have the most difficulty with. We, we tend to be pretty good at, you know, once we've heard a melody 10 or 12 times, and most of us have heard these standards many more than that, we have a sense of where it is, or we know when it's right, we know when it's wrong. So learning tunes, the, the shortcut, as far as I'm concerned, is understanding that there are a lot of songs that are very, very similar to each other. So the main thing I want you to get is you should be doing this. If you're an adult amateur, if you're new to this, memorize a song. It, it, it's, it's a really kind of a powerful feeling too that you own this thing. You have this thing. You worked hard and it's yours now. So that's a big deal. And like I said, it, it really unleashes a lot when you do some memorizing. So that's the why part. And now the how part is this idea of understanding what's underneath. Now, um, I had played jazz for a long time before I figured this out. So yes, some people took me aside or gave me this little hint. I'm not the first one to notice these similarities between these songs, right? So the trick part is now where do you get this information? So, okay, you're tuning in here and digging deeper. That's fantastic. Well, this is exactly what we do each week, week in, week out at jazzwire.net. So if you're interested in this information, but on an ongoing way, in a way where you and I and hundreds of people from around the world can interact, all the great adult amateur musicians we're working with, check out Jazzwire because that's the deal, right? is this makes a lot of sense to you right now. And it's like, oh yeah, it never occurred to me. I Got It Bad and That Ain't Good by Duke Ellington and Desifonado by Jobim use the same structure. You may never come across that or you may randomly find a video like this one that tells you that. Well, how about if we were doing this week in, week out in an organized, systematic way? So that's what we do. So that's the trick. So yes, that was a bit of a little sales thing there, but um, I'm not trying to make a sale. What I'm trying to do is give you the information and let you know there's a way to go ahead with this stuff and be like really successful and get twice as good, twice as quick. And the secret isn't that I have the secret to everything. The secret is the organization and the fact that things are progressing from song to song, from item to item. That's the important part in your practice. And so that's one of the things that we're doing right here with this music. So I hope, now, so what does that mean? Let's dig into that a little more. I wanna say more about that. So um, one of the things we did in Jazzwire this week is worked on, well, as an example, let's use these songs. Take the A train, great. So we played Take the A train, talked about that harmonic form and everything. So now, one of the things I could have done is said, great, let's, let's work on So What, a modal song. Or I could have said, let's work on Summertime, a minor tune. Or I could, could have said, let's work on Giant Steps, sort of a cool, you know, modern butt kicker of a tune. All that is good, except for it's bad. If you just spent time on Take the A Train, how about if we move on to something that's very similar? How about if we move on to Girl From Ipanema? So you can take everything you learned in the last week or two and show up to this new song ready to go. You show up with some information. You're not starting at zero all the time. That's not a good way to keep yourself motivated. It's not a great way to learn. We want to lean things on one another. So many teachers just move on to an entirely different song because they're bored. 
huh, I'm tired of major. I want to do a minor tune. That's terrible. That's terrible teaching. There is a time to move on to a minor tune, but systematized learning has to do with let's, let's do a couple things in a row. Let's get a head of steam going. Then let's move on to minor songs and do two or three or four in that category. That's what I want you guys to have, that sort of organization in your practice. I hope you find it somewhere, and we can certainly provide that for you at Jazzwire. So I hope this helps. How to learn tunes. This is the shortcut, is you start learning for songs that are similar. There's so many sets of chord changes like this. All right, go out there, memorize a tune. By the end of the week, memorize a tune. Thanks a lot, and if you'd like to uh, get this PDF from me, uh, just email us and uh, send it off to you. Thanks a lot, happy practicing. Take care.